and welcome to Crash Course Cryptozoology. So, evidently, today is a different video because I'd like to start this series on reviewing cryptozoology books and reviewing literature. And I wanted to do that because I do think it's imperative to be well read in any scientific field that you go into, but especially in a discipline like zoology, and by extension, of course, cryptozoology. And with cryptozoology, because it, it, there's so many different perspectives to be talked about in cryptozoology, to be assessed, to be analyzed, and to have opinions made of. So having a wide range of that at your disposal really seems like a, a really solid way to be well-rounded in this field and to have extensive knowledge on the subjects that you'll be discussing as, as someone who's in a cryptozoology. Now, of course, there's that side to that, and there's the reading side. Reading is a wonderful thing in the first place, you know. We have some weather. I hope everyone's doing well with weather, because we up in New England here have a nor'easter coming our way, and you can't quite see it the window here, but it's certainly quite visible, perhaps, by the coloration of the whiteness that's out there. It's, uh, it's very snowy outside. We're supposed to get about two to three feet in the next few hours here. So hopefully, we'll be bundled up enough here for that. I have, you know, a long sleeve on instead of my usual weekend t-shirt. I have blankets ready. We have uh, pretty okay insulation in this dorm room. I, I'm going to college right now, so the dorm rooms, especially on the ground level, are a bit colder, but beggars cannot be choosers. Uh, I find that on days such as this, when you're looking to spend the day reading a good book, it's really just a wonderful enhancement to the experience to have some comforts with you. So, like, for example, this morning, when I had my breakfast, I also decided to make some hot chocolate, and there is this wonderful hot chocolate that I received as a holiday present. It's, uh, it's a Vermont brand called Silly Cow Farms, and it's really quite good. It comes in these small little glass jars, which of course is great because that means they're recyclable. Uh, there are different flavors for the chocolate, and it goes well with milk. I had to use water myself today, but uh, it, was, it was still quite good. So I highly recommend getting some kind of, of beverage of your choosing, whether it be milk, hot chocolate, coffee perhaps, anything that really makes you feel at very much at ease and relaxed because you want to give your attention to that book. And also, I like to take breaks while I'm reading sometimes. And one great way to, to, to kind of enhance the experience of reading while you're taking a break from it, I believe anywhere, or at least I find, is to listen to the radio. And it's funny because you can actually get these at your local Walgreens or your local Walmart or whatever pharmacy shops you might have out there. And they're quite cool because they're these little working FM radios. And most of the time, FM is just music, which is still great. But you can also go to some areas like the one that I live in where there are still talk shows on FM. So you get to listen to some interesting discussion while you're taking a break from reading. And you get to stimulate your mind while you're relaxing and taking a break from whatever wondrous book you're reading, and today's book truly is a wondrous one. The book I want to review first in this series is, personally, not just my favorite cryptozoology book, but I believe it to be genuinely one of the best out there, and that is North America's Great Ape, the Sasquatch. A Wildlife Biologist Looks at the Continent's Most Misunderstood Large Mammal by Dr. John A. Bindernagel, who passed away in 2018. Now, John Bindernagel was a, was a very interesting person, and you, and you kind of see that reflected in his work here. He's written two books in his lifetime. I don't have a second one, which is The Discovery of the Sasquatch, but I have this one. And it's really got this wonderful cover to it. It's got this kind of almost rustic fall background to it with this great sketch in the middle. And this sketch, in greater detail, actually does pop up as an illustration in this book. And as for the book itself, for one thing, Dr. John Bindernagel, who was a, a, a naturalist, and he was... He really was one of the world's most experienced wildlife biologists, partially because he worked for the UN for a while. There's uh, an excerpt in the back that'll read more towards the end of the video here about that. But to get an idea of where Bindernagel, as a wildlife biologist, one who was very experienced and had a very long and successful career traveling around the world, has on the Sasquatch, his perspective, I'd like to read an excerpt from the first chapter, which is on page three, and it is called the Sasquatch, a valid subject for study, with a question mark at the end. Previous books on the subject have dealt with these issues to varying degrees of satisfaction. As a wildlife biologist, I have approached the existence of the Sasquatch in the same way I would assess the existence of any large mammal, be it the grizzly bear, black bear, or mountain gorilla. 
In short, my interest in the Sasquatch begins at that point in the discussion, when a skeptic finally asks, if it does exist, what does it eat? How does it behave? And how does it survive the winters? And, you know, how indeed? Having accepted the available evidence as sufficient to document the existence of the Sasquatch, I feel that these are the questions we should now be addressing. And really, this is the main driving force behind this book and all of Binder Nagel's work that he did across his lifetime on the Sasquatch. This perspective that the evidence is sufficient. The evidence is sufficient. We are aware that there is a zoological phenomenon taking place here. Now the question is, how do we begin to study that? And this book is an attempt, in part, to answer that question. But it is also one of the most thorough Bigfoot books out there. It truly, truly is. And just to start off, there are multiple chapters dedicated to talking about eyewitness testimony. And he discusses roughly 150 different eyewitness testimonies just in this book alone, spanning across the entire book. Most of them coagulate kind of towards the beginning of the book, because that's kind of where it focuses more on the anatomy, the physical descriptions being given by eyewitnesses. And that comes with eyewitness sketches, which he provides quite a few of. We have this magnificent one right here, which is kind of one of his favorites. He used it quite often in his presentations. It says, <clears throat> Figure 1. Eyewitness drawing of Sasquatch observed near Comics Lake, Vancouver Island, British Columbia, December 13th, 1980. We have a, uh, another sketch not too far away from that one that's really quite interesting, which is this, uh, this one drawn by uh, William Rowe, who's, a, who's kind of a famous eyewitness because of, I believe he, he had an affidavit swearing in court uh, to the, the, his testimony of seeing Sasquatch. Figure 5. Adult female Sasquatch observed by William Rowe on Micah Mountain, British Columbia, in October 1955. And we also have this sketch here, which is, uh, I don't believe this is done by Binnernickel, this is drawn by uh, Wendy Dyke, or Deke? I'm not sure how the name is uh, pronounced, unfortunately. But there are these wonderful sketches that are comparative anatomy between the anatomy of a standing upright bear and an alleged Sasquatch. And the whole point behind it isn't just to illustrate the Sasquatch, it's to highlight differences. So when you hear of a Sasquatch sighting, what this book posits is, well, let's say you're considering that this person saw a bear. Is this person describing, for example, uh, a flat face or broad shoulders? Because if so, these are not features of the standing upright bears. Which is really, you know, that makes a, a, a for an, a, a very compelling eyewitness testimony. And of course, eyewitness testimony is what we usually have to work with in the field, and being able to distinguish features like that is really key. We also have these great chapters on uh, anatomy that start off with tracks. Now, not just tracks as in looking at Bigfoot tracks, but also looking at other animal tracks, learning to identify what a bear trackway looks like, a bear's double step, would that be mistaken for a Sasquatch print? In many cases, yes. But he also makes the argument that there are cases, such as this one perhaps, where this is not what we observe. This picture on the left here is actually of a, uh, a track that Binder Nagel himself had cast. And we have more pictures here of what some fake footprints can look like, what ones that have not been disproven yet look like, the highlighted differences between alleged Sasquatch tracks and human foot anatomy, even some really interesting comparisons between some rather strange Sasquatch tracks and known great ape tracks. And talking more about gait and anatomy as the book goes on, and really getting into nitty-gritty detail. I mean, we're talking about segments that discuss sexual dimorphism in reports. So, you know, males having, when they're described as males by witnesses, having higher sagittal crest descriptions than female descriptions. Or the amount of hairs on the shoulders are actually attributed to sex in many of these sightings. As well as other features that you would just, you know, you'd never think of. You would never think that these have any basis in uh, the, the description of sex, but indeed we do. Even the size of canine teeth, we have a segment here. Other sex-linked anatomical features of the Sasquatch are discussed in Appendix 2. These include the size of canine teeth, development of the sagittal crest and brow ridges on the skull, and the length of shoulder hair. The fact that he can, or th that he did find that those were actually features spreads throughout sightings that can be accurately, according to sighting, split between the two sexes being described. 
I mean, it's just remarkable research. It's fascinating. He goes so into depth. Every single chapter gets into exactly that amount of nitty-gritty detail, and it's really great. We talk about, you know, the sign of Sasquatch. Uh, we also talk about the behavior of the Sasquatch quite a bit, and that's personally my favorite part of this book, because he really does leave no stone unturned. The only thing that he, I think, seems to have missed uh, was was wood knocking, the significance of wood knocking. And I say that because he also attributes much of, he, I should say, he compares and contrasts much of the behavior of the Sasquatch, almost all of it really, to behaviors that we do see in the great apes, so in gorillas, orangutans, and chimpanzees. In fact, there are diagrams he's got, these tables, that compare the anatomy and the gait of the Sasquatch to apes, as well as the behavior. And we have these just incredible tables that showcase, you know, yes, we see this and this, and yes, we see it this percent of the time, and, you know, just incredibly scientifically detailed. And, and that's personally my favorite part of this book, is his comparisons between the known great apes and this potential new great ape. It, again, in sexual dimorphism, we see this as well. And that's why I say I believe he fell short on only wood knocking, because we didn't know that chips would knock until... Uh, shortly before Binnernagel's passing, so after he wrote this book. So I won't go into uh, massive detail, because I, I would like people to experience this book for themselves, but it really is, uh, I believe, the greatest book on the subject ever written. And to kind of get an idea of the person who, who was behind that, the driving force for why it's so scientific, here's that blurb about Binnernagel. Dr. John Binnernagel is a wildlife biologist with over 30 years of field experience. He has served as a wildlife advisor for United Nations projects in East Africa, Iran, the Caribbean, and Belize. His interest in the Sasquatch dates from 1963, and his field work in British Columbia began in 1975. He holds a BSA from the University of Guelph and an MS and PhD from the University of Washington. He can oh sorry, Wisconsin. He continues to work as a consultant in environmental impact assessment and is a registered professional biologist in British Columbia, Canada. So you know, a real class act, scientifically. And again, he, he wrote an absolutely wonderful book, and he's really great at writing it, too. He was very, you know, enthralling. You never felt bored. I never felt bored, I should say, writing this book. Reading this book, my mistake. It really is a fantastic read. And it's hard to find. It's very hard to find. My initial copy actually was not my own. I borrowed it from Alexander Pedicol about two years ago, and was able to find my, my own copy, which, uh, they're quite expensive, actually, because some of the more expensive cryptozoology books on the market partially because there's not many left in print. Uh, I always recommend to people to use the app Thrift Books. It is free to get. You can add books that you want to a wish list from this massive database they have for online selling. And it notifies you when one comes up, and most of the time they're very cheap prices. So stuff like this will still cost you about $80 because it's it's a book that's rather expensive. but. It's, uh, it's definitely lower than what you'll find at other websites. So I highly recommend Thrift Books, and of course, I highly recommend, again, North America's Great Ape the Sasquatch by John Bindernagel. It's a wonderful book, and I hope that if you do get it, that you're enjoying the weather you're reading it in, you're nice and cozy, and I hope that this video has encouraged you to look more into the literature that's out there, because it really is a fantastic amount of it, and I'm excited to share more of it with you.